It's good to be here this morning. Um, I just want you to know I'm ready. (laughs) Most of all, I want you to know what an incredible church we have. Um, I got here about, I don't know, 7-ish, 7, 7.30, and uh, Lucas was here. Uh, if you haven't met Lucas, you really got, you just need to meet Lucas sometime. He is incredible. He's our tech director, and he is, he's just, just a great, great guy. And he was here sitting, drinking a cup of coffee and, and waiting to see what was going to happen at 8 o'clock. Uh, some more volunteers and staff had rolled in and we sat and we had a short meeting and we said, what are we going to do? Power's out. And we got a few options and, uh, and the, the decision was we go forward. We have services this morning. And so we, got, we found these lanterns and, uh, and some other uh, lights and we started setting things up and and we were absolutely good to go if there was no power this morning. We were absolutely ready to go for worship uh, at, uh, at 9.30. 9 o'clock, the power came on. I was disappointed. I really was. Um, I thought it was going to be just a, such a pretty service, acoustic, you know, in the dim light. And it was going to be wonderful with, with us creating the heat with our body heat, you know. And, but, um, but, you know, the power came on, and that's cool, too. Um, but most of all, I just want to, I just really want to give a shout out to the staff and volunteers who just kind of like roll with it. It's like, here we go, we're going to worship, and so how are we going to make this happen? And it was, it was good to go. So I am thanking my staff and, vol- and the volunteers of the church because they're wonderful. And thank you for being here this morning. And I know it wasn't easy for some of you to get ready in the dark and, and, uh, and leave your homes and come to worship, but here you are. And so uh, let's just take a moment and uh, clear our heads and our hearts, prepare ourselves to hear the Word of God. Uh, Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father God, we appreciate power. We appreciate the lights and the heat and and the hot coffee and and all of that. we thank you for it, and we thank you for turning it all on for us this morning. Um, but we thank you most of all that you are the source of the real power that we need. You are the source of, of uh, the joy and the strength and the commitment and, um, and the motivation and the desire, Lord, to worship you whether we have electric lights or not. Um, you have placed your spirit in our hearts, and you have given us Uh, this passion to love you and to love others and to gather together on a morning like this and to praise you and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for empowering us in this way and continue to pour your power into us um, that we might be everything that you've called us to be. Uh, Receive our worship this morning uh, and the praise we offer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We are in a series. We started last week. Pastor John kicked us off in great fashion. Uh, We're calling it Long Story Short. We're looking at some characters from the Old Testament. Last week, Pastor John talked about Cain and Abel. And this week, we're going to talk about Noah. And the message is called Building a Life Boat. Um, Yeah, it's a play on the boat and the ark and all of that, but really the focus is going to be on building a life. That's what I want to talk about today. How do we build a life? In particular, how do we build a life of faith? Because that's what Noah was known for. Noah was uh, in the Hall of Fame of Faith, which is in Hebrews 11. If you haven't read it recently, I'd encourage you to to go ahead and read it sometime. It's a great chapter of people who um, are kind of on the, you know, on the, and and, and (laughs) I always want to say Rich Stadium. I did it last last night too, and I still can't think of what the Bills, the, what's the name of the stadium the Bills play at? New Era Field. It'll always be Rich Stadium to me, but in New Era Field, they have that wall of fame, you know, for people to really stand out in some particular way. Well, in Hebrews 11, there is a wall of fame of faith. They're a hall of fame of faith. These are people from the Old Testament who had such incredible faith that they're noted in Hebrews 11 for it. Um, they are the, if you will, I'm trying to be cool and hip and modern, they are the goats of faith. Who knows what I mean by goats, right? The greatest of all time. That's right. These are the goats of faith. And Noah was one of them. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, it says, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. 
By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Noah had a holy fear, it says, and that, that refers to his reverence for God. Uh, not, not a fear that made him um, necessarily cower, you know, like God is going to strike me with lightning or any of that kind of stuff, but it was a holy reverence for who God was. He just had a deep appreciation for the power of God, and, and that caused him to live his life in faith. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about today is Noah's faith. Here's my main point. Oh, actually, before we do that, um, I think I have a verse, uh, I skipped it, but Rick, if you go back to it, this is a definition of faith that I, I kind of came up with, but it's not really original with me. You know, it's, it's, it's just from reading and thinking and, and from what the Bible tells us about faith. But um, this is how I'm describing faith today. Faith is trust that God will do what he says and trust that does what God says to do. So there's two aspects to that, right? There's the belief part, trust that God will do what he says. If God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. But then there's the response part, and that is the faith that we have that, that does what God says to do, whether we understand it or not. So that, I think, encompasses what faith is about. I believe God's word, and in response to God's word, I act. I live my life in response to what God has said. And that describes Noah. And my main point today is this. Building a life of faith is not dependent on our understanding of God's plans, but on our trust in the God who plans. Does that make sense? It's not that we always understand. A lot of times we don't understand what God is doing, but faith is not dependent on understanding what God is doing. It's just dependent on understanding that he is God right? And I believe in him. He has proved himself to me. Has he proved himself to you? If he's proved himself to you, give him a hand clap of praise right now. Has God proved himself to you? Has, be, has he been there for you, right? Has he given you strength when you were weak? Has he given you guidance when you were lost? Has he saved you from your sins? Has he assured you that you are forgiven and that he loves you, right? If he has proved himself to you, then we don't need to understand everything that he does or all of his plans. We just need to trust in the God who has proved himself to us. And Noah had that kind of faith, and that's what we're talking about um, today. A lot of times, <laughs> this is in my notes, okay, so I prepared this sermon earlier this week, but it says in my notes, faith a lot of times is what we have to have when we're in the dark. <laughs> Would have been appropriate if the lights had, had stayed off, and I could have told you that, but, but it's true, right? Faith is what we have to have a lot of times when we're in the dark, Right? That's when we're called on for our faith. So, so we say things like, I don't know why this is happening, but I will trust God. I don't know how this is going to go, but I will trust God. I don't know where this is headed, but I will trust God. I'll take the next step God has made clear to me, and I will trust that he's working his perfect plan. You probably know this verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, for we live by faith, not by sight. For we live by faith, not by sight. And I was playing around with this. Sometimes I do this, and I, and I would encourage you to do it sometimes too, because the Bible doesn't always tell us where to place the stress and when we read a, a verse like that. And sometimes in my reading and my studying, I'll just move the stress around a little bit and see what that says to me. Okay, so for example, when we read that, you, I'm guessing that most of us put the stress on the word faith. For we live by faith, not by sight. Right? Wouldn't that be the normal place to put the stress? But what if we move that a little bit? What if we said, for we live by faith, not by sight? Oh, well, that kind of gives me a new sense of this, right? Because I'm looking at a church full of people who have just said to me that God has proved him, proven himself to you, and so I know you're living by faith, and we together are living by faith, not by sight. And how cool is that? How good is that that we're doing that together, right? We're all, we're all living by faith, not by sight. And that encourages me, and it should encourage you, right? Right? I mean, the fact that you're here this morning is an incredible encouragement. I, I have thought we'd be, you know, having about, you know, 10 people in these rows here, and, and that would be it. But here you are. Why? Because you trust and worship God, and you came. So we live by faith. Now, what if we move the, the stress to the next word? For we live by faith, not by sight. When I did that, I thought a, a whole new set of things. Okay, all these new insights came to me. We live. In other words, we come alive when we have faith in God. 
suddenly the things that would, would rob us of life, that would steal the joy of life, that would take us out of, out of really living and, and experiencing life to the full, they, they start to wash away. They start to disappear in the faith. Right? Because we live by faith. We come alive by faith. This is what Jesus was saying. He said, you want abundant life? Find it in me. You want to really live? He says, trust me. And then these things that are holding you back, right, that are causing you doubt and fear and, 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 and disrupting your life, they start to disappear. You will come alive when you live by faith. We all live by faith. You have to live by faith. You have no choice because you don't know what tomorrow holds, right? You just do the things you do today in hopes that it's going to go well tomorrow or these things are going to pan out, right? The thing is, what are you putting your faith and trust in? Noah put his faith and trust in God. He lived by faith, not by sight. So let's take a look at Noah's story, starting in Genesis 6. We're not gonna, it's actually Genesis 6 through 9. We're not going to read all of it, but we'll read some verses uh, in that uh, section and, and look at the story of Noah. So starting with Genesis 6, verse 5, and we're going to go to verse 7. The Lord saw how great... Uh, I should preface this by saying, um, people have been on the earth for a number of generations by this time, and unfortunately, what we're going to read now lets us know that a lot of people had turned aside from God. In fact, almost all of the world had turned aside from God already. So the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them, the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Wow. I mean, you really just need to pause after reading that and think about that. All right? Think about the, the weight of that. that. That God looked at the world he had made and the people he had, he had placed on the earth and he, he looked it into the hearts of each and every one, and he saw, what does it say? Great wickedness. Every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart, only evil, only evil, all the time. It's not that people were just doing evil. Every inclination of their heart was evil. Every desire of their heart was evil. Every plan they were coming up was evil. Everything they wanted to do was some kind of evil. The abuse, the violence, the, the rape, the murder, the stealing, the slander, the, the, the way people were, were treating each other, treating the children, treating... It was only evil all the time. And what's God's response to that? His very first response is grief. It's regret. It, you know, you can almost hear God in these verses saying, how, how, could they, how could they do this? What happened? How could they go so far astray from me? And he comes to an awful conclusion, just this conclusion that the only thing he can do is destroy every living thing. It is that bad. I mean, we say things get bad sometimes. You know, we look around our world, we listen to the news, we read things, and we, we say, how horrible that is, how horrible that is. But we also know there's a lot of good in the world. There's a lot of kindness and compassion and generosity and, and good things in the world. I think that's the grace of God. God looked at this world and he said, I, I can't find anything. I can't find any, anybody who is good, compassionate, kind, gracious. And so, I have to remove them. I have to destroy them. Wow. The Bible tells us that God is patient. God is patient. But God is also holy and just. And a time comes when God's judgment for sin is inevitable. This isn't the part of God that we like to think about all that much. We'd much prefer to sing about love and grace and mercy and forgiveness, and, and all of that is true about God, or else we wouldn't be sitting here. But the reality is 
that God's patience will reach a time for each and every one of us when it's done. And then there's judgment that may come when we individually die. The Bible tells us that there will be a day in the future when God will again destroy the earth and create a new heaven and a new earth. But God's patience will come to an end at some point in regards to sin. We have to keep these two verses in tension, therefore. 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Peter is responding to those. Peter has been preaching about Jesus coming back and the judgment that's going to come on the earth. And some people are saying, you know, you keep talking about this, Peter, but <laughs> we don't see it. It's not happening. You know, I mean, uh, you know, maybe it never will happen, right? And, and, and Peter responds this way and says, no, God isn't slow in keeping his promise. Uh, he's going to come back in judgment. Um, but he is patient with you. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The reason God hasn't come back yet, the reason Jesus hasn't returned yet in judgment is because God is giving people more time to come to faith in him. That's it. He's giving us more time to share the message of the gospel with others who need to hear it. Okay? Because Hebrews 9.27 says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment is the, is the other side of that. There will be a judgment. Now, for those who are in Christ, we know what the outcome of that judgment is going to be. God will say to you, you trusted in my son Jesus. He paid for your sins on the cross, and you put your faith in him. The penalty has been paid. Your chains are gone. You have been set free. Amazing grace, right? But for those who say, I want nothing to do with Jesus, I don't care about that, I don't need anyone to forgive me for my sins, I can stand on my own merits, God will say, no, you can't. And they will be judged for that. Jesus died for us because of the grace of God. And Noah built a life of faith powered by the grace of God. Genesis 6, 8 why was Noah spared? Why was Noah and his family spared? Was it because he was without sin? No. No, <laughs> thank you. Because if you know your Bible, you know what the Bible says, right? There's no human being who was without sin. There was only one sinless person who ever walked this earth, Jesus Christ. Everyone else, all of us have sinned, right? Noah wasn't without sin, all right? So we need to, we need to remember that. That's what the Bible teaches us. Um, but then the Bible says this in Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. To find favor in the eyes of the Lord is to experience God's grace. So then we ask ourselves, well, why did Noah find God's grace? Why, why was God gracious to Noah? What, why, why did he find favor in the eyes of the Lord? Well, Genesis goes on to say Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. So he wasn't sinless, he wasn't perfect, but he was righteous. And I've said before, the, the definition of righteousness is to have a heart that seeks after God, okay? To really, my mother said this the other day, I, I was talking with her and, and she was talking about um, various things related to this. She said, you know, Jesus doesn't love us because we're perfect, but because we want to be. And I thought, that's, I can go with that. I can work with that. Yeah, I want to be perfectly righteous. I want to be perfectly holy. I'm not, but I want to be. And I'm trusting Jesus to make me perfectly righteous and perfectly holy. And I know through Jesus, God sees me as perfectly righteous and holy. He sees me as what I'm becoming, right? That's what it means to be righteous. It's to seek after God's heart, to want to please him, to want to be perfect in all of our ways. That's righteousness. It's not to be sinless. It says that Noah was blameless among the people of his time. From what we understand of the people of his time, it didn't take a whole lot to be blameless compared to the people of his time, but Noah was blameless among the people of his time. But then it says this one other thing. It says in that verse, in Genesis 6, 8, uh, 6 9, excuse me, he walked faithfully with God. And there it is again, his faith. He walked faithfully with God. I, I was thinking about um, when my grandson was two and a half, three years old, we'd go out for walks, you know, and, and, and we'd be walking down, I can picture, it, we'd be walking down the sidewalk, and, and I'd be talking, you know, we'd, and then all of a sudden I realize, he's, wait a minute, where are you, right? Well, he's back here, right, because there's an ant 
walking around on the ground, and he had to stop and converse with the ant for a while, right? And, <laughs> and, and then he, uh, come on, Ephraim, let's go. And then he, okay, and then we walk along, and then, uh, wait, wait a minute, Ephraim, you know, come, let's keep walking, right? And, 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 you know, I don't know if we could say he was walking faithfully with me or not, you know, but I was trying to walk faithfully with him. But, but here's the thing, we're like that, aren't we? We start out on a journey with God. We start walking with God. Yeah, this is good. I love the praise songs, and I'm singing, and it's good, and I feel good. And, and then what happens? We get tempted. Some sin tempts us, right? Or something distracts us. And all of a sudden, we're stopping. We're on here, and we're, we're, we're doing this, and, and God is down here. And God, what does he do? He says to us, come on. Come on. Keep walking with me. Just keep walking with me. Let's go. Let's go this direction. Walk faithfully with me. And we're seeking to do that. That's what Noah did. He walked faithfully with God. Not perfectly, but faithfully. Even in his sin, he looked to God for God's love and mercy and grace. That's walking faithfully with God. This is why God was gracious to Noah. Noah built his life of faith on a couple of principles I want to share with you. Here's one. Build for the future that you can't see, but that you trust God for. Genesis 6, 17, God says, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. In chapter 7, God says, I'm going to bring rain on the earth. Do you know that Noah would have no idea what rain was? He would have no clue because it had never rained on the earth up to that point. All right? Scholars believe that, that at that point, the earth was watered by this, these underground streams that would send up a mist, and that was what created the, the water to allow things to grow. But no rain had come down. So, so when God says to Noah, I'm going to bring a flood on the earth, Noah's probably thinking, How's that gonna, how does that happen? I'm, and I've never seen a flood. What is a flood exactly? And what is rain? He didn't know, but he trusted God for the future that he couldn't see, but that God proclaimed to him. And that's what Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us faith is. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Because where's our assurance? It's not in us, it's in God. If God said it, how does that go? God said it, I believe it, that's good enough for me. Right? And that's the way that Noah walked faithfully with God. So how does this work in real life? I was thinking about some people I know who are single. And they're not particularly, um, you know, they wish that they were married, okay? How, do, how does this work in their life? How do they, they live in this assurance um, about what they cannot see? Well, what does God promise each and every one of us? Contentment. God promises to give us contentment. Does God promise to give each and every one of us who's single a spouse? No, he doesn't. But he does promise to give us contentment. Well, Lord, I'm single and I, I, I'm not particularly in a contented place about that. How am I going to become content with that? Well, maybe God will bring a spouse into your life, right? That's one way. Or maybe God will give you a settled heart about singleness. That's another way. Or maybe God will give you a purpose that so overwhelms your desire to be married that you don't even think about that as your main objective any longer. That's another way. And maybe there's something else God will do in your life that will bring you that contentment. But God promises you contentment. So do you live in faith that God is going to bring me to a place of contentment even if he doesn't give me this thing that I, I really think that I want or need right now? Do we trust God to do that? Do we trust in his promise? Here's another principle that, that Noah built on. Build even if no one else believes in what you see by faith. Genesis 7, 5, and 6, Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. If you're going to live by faith in God, sometimes you're going to find yourself walking with God all alone. There's not going to be anybody else around you. It's just going to be you and God, okay? No one knows exactly how long it took Noah to build the ark. The estimates are from like 55 years to 120 years. No one knows exactly. You know the ark was huge, right? It was a football and a half uh, long, okay, football field and a half long. It was three stories high, uh, big enough to hold 522 freight car trains. Um, sometimes when I'm running, I have to I cross this, uh, this railroad uh, crossing, and if the train is coming, I do stop because that's a smart thing to do, and, I, and the gate, you know, so I stop and I wait. And while I'm waiting, you know, to get running, 
running again, sometimes I count the cars. And, you know, 100 freight cars is a whole lot of freight cars, right? 522 freight cars could fit on the ark, okay? So this is a massive structure, a massive thing, all right? And Noah didn't do all that by himself, and I don't even think Noah and his three sons could have done all that by himself. So I think that Noah probably enlisted the help of townspeople. You know, he probably either paid them or he gave them lunch or something, but he invited people to come and help him build this ark. And, and they're out in the, in the wilderness, right? They're not, near, they're not next to the lake. So convincing people to do this, you know, they, I'm guessing that some of the people who worked on this ark, they didn't believe in what Noah was saying at all, but they just came out because, hey, we got nothing else to do today, and, you know, building a boat might be kind of fun, and besides, we can hang out together, and Noah's going to give us lunch. Okay, so here we are. We're building this ark year after year after year. And the Bible tells us in 2 Peter, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So while they're building the ark, I imagine Noah, you know, he's, he's slinging a hammer and he's saying, you know, the reason we're doing this, guys, is because God is going to send a flood of judgment someday, you know, and the only people that are going to be saved are the people that are on this ark. We've got to believe God and trust God for this. And, and I know that you can get on this ark if you just believe God and trust in God, but you've got to know the judgment's coming one day, so you better be ready, right? Are you, are you going to believe God? You know what we know? At the end of however many years it took for them to build that thing, the only people that believed were Noah and his family. Nobody else believed. How do I know that? Because they weren't on the ark. If they believed, they would have been on the ark. But they weren't. They weren't. I think about this church that we're sitting in, this building. Twelve years ago, we built this building. A number of people helped us. Some of those people... They're not, it, it's not that they're worshiping elsewhere for various reasons. That happens. People move, etc. I know that there are people who helped build this building who are no longer worshiping God. And that breaks my heart. It seriously breaks my heart. They helped to put this together so that we could worship God in this place. And they no longer worship God. And I want to say, you know, I don't care about the building. I, I'd rather you worship God. We could worship them in the field out back. We had to, right? Don't give up. This isn't the thing. It's that we worship the Lord. At the end of those years, nobody but Noah and his family were worshiping God. It just confirms what God said, that he couldn't find any righteous people on the earth. But here's the thing to remember. Even if no one else was persuaded by Noah's preaching, his family was. Because this is what we read. Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. And I believe the only reason that they could get on the ark was because they put their trust and faith in God too. They may not have believed at first when, when you know, dad says, okay, guys, God has spoken to me. And he's told me that we got to build this big structure uh, because there's a flood coming. It's going to cover the whole earth. And the only way we're going to be saved is if we are on that structure, on that ark. So you got to help me build this thing. It's going to take us a long time and a lot of work, but that's what we got to do. And in the beginning, I don't know, one or two or maybe all three of his sons, his daughters-in-law, maybe they said, just, Dad, are you okay? <laughs> I mean, are you all right? You've been feeling well lately, you know. But at the end of the day, I believe that they all put their faith and trust in what he was saying about God. They put their faith and trust in God too. So even if no one else comes to believe us, maybe we're building a life of faith to win over our family to faith. Right? Right? And how do we do that? Same way Noah did. We tell the truth of the gospel, preach it, and we live it in our lives. What better witness did people have than Noah going out every day building an ark in the wilderness because he believed God, right? They saw it in his life day after day, and they came to believe it as well. They got on the ark, and this is, I think, a very cool picture. Genesis 7, 16 says, God shut the door. God shut the door. Isn't that neat? God sealed them in. To me, that's another picture of God's grace, right? That God said, I am going to protect you. I'm going to take care of you. And here's a sign of that. I'm going to seal this door of the vessel that is your salvation. 
I am closing you in. If you have God's protection, you are in a very good place. What could Noah and his family do? Surrender themselves completely to the Lord. You know what an ark is? It's not really a boat. It's a box. That's really what an ark is. It's just a big box. There's no rudder. There's no way to steer it. There's no way to make it go where you want it to go. So all Noah and his family could do was be sealed into this by God and then trust God to float it around where he wanted to float it around and land it where he wanted to land it and take care of them all the time that they were on it. Complete surrender of their lives to God. Why did Noah surrender his life to God and his family in that way? Because of faith. Because they trusted God. He's the God who had never let them down. He had made his promises come true, come to fruition, and they believed him. And so they surrendered their life to him. My mom collects frogs, not the live kind, okay? But she collects little frogs, you know, and, uh, and has a whole bunch of them uh, around her living room. You know why she collects frogs? Because she loves what F-R-O-G stands for. Do you know what F-R-O-G stands for? Fully rely on God. And when she sees her frogs, that's what she thinks of. Frog. Fully rely on God. That's what Noah and his family were doing. And the good news is that they had put their faith in a powerful, protective, promise-keeping God. God sent the floodwaters. The earth was inundated. Everyone else did lose their lives. God protected them for over a year on the ark until he rested it on Mount Ararat, opened the door, and let them out. The first thing Noah did when he got out of the ark was he made an offering to God on an altar. And I think he made the offering for these three reasons. He was serving up worship to the God who was powerful and protective and promise-keeping. Powerful enough to bring a flood that would destroy everything. Protective in the way that he oversaw Noah and his family and brought them safely out of that ark. And promise-keeping because God did exactly what God said he was going to do all the way through. And then God makes another promise, Genesis 9. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. God is saying, I'm never going to bring another flood to destroy the earth. And here's the sign of my promise. I've set my rainbow in the clouds And it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life. On the earth. How many of you love to see a rainbow? How many of you love, you know, you just, you stop the car, right? Right? And, and take a picture or just look at it for a little while, right? That's beautiful. It is a sign that God has given us to remind us He will never again flood the earth like this. And on a day like this, aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad we don't live in terror every time it begins to rain? Like, oh no, is it happening again? No. No fear, because God said he would never flood the earth like that again. And the rainbow is the sign of his promise. He is a gracious God. Now, remember, though, God has said that he is going to bring judgment on the whole earth again. Not by flood, but by fire. And Jesus says when that day comes, a lot of people are going to be living just like they were in Noah's day. In other words, apart from God, Just living their lives as if God doesn't matter and he's irrelevant. But it is going to come. And the thing we need to ask ourselves is, are we ready for that? You know, there was only one ark. There was only one way to be saved in that flood, and that was to get on the one ark. And the New Testament says that Jesus, that ark is a picture of Jesus. 
And the only way we can be saved from judgment today is to get on board with Jesus. He's the only way. We can't find another way, our own way. He is the way to be saved from judgment. And he will save all who come to him because he is a God of grace. And as a God of grace, he not only saves us, but he also empowers us to live the life of faith. See, he gives us faith by grace, and then he empowers us to live our faith by his grace. This is a quote uh, that I took from a devotional I was reading this week, Paul David Tripp. I'm going to go slow because someone last night said they really liked this, but it went too quickly, so I'm going to read it slower. God gives us the power to first believe, but he doesn't stop there. By grace, he works in the situations, locations, and relationships of our everyday lives to craft, hammer, bend, and mold us into people who build life based on the radical belief that he really does exist and he really does reward those who seek him. He is transforming you into a person who lives a life shaped by radical, God-centered faith. That's a gracious God. It's a good God. It's a God who loves us and invites all of us into the relationship with him through Jesus. And if you don't have that relationship, please speak to one of us after the service today. Or just take a moment when we go to prayer in a second and bow your head and, and ask God to forgive you for your sins because of what his son Jesus has done and to pour his Holy Spirit into you. It starts there, but it doesn't stop there. It goes on as God continues to fill us with his spirit and give us the strength and ability to live this life of faith we're called to. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for allowing us to be here this morning. It is by your grace that we are able to gather, and we give you thanks for that. And it's by your grace that we are called to a life of faith, and we thank you for that. And it's by your grace that we are empowered to live a life of faith. So continue to pour your grace into us. Help us to become people of of deep and abiding faith um, so that however the rest of the, the world walks, we will walk faithfully with you in holy fear and reverence of who you are because you are a great and wonderful God and we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.